Welcome back. You're watching Showdown. We're joined now by another senator, but with some slightly different philosophical views to the last senator. We're joined by Greens Senator Leary Annan out of Canberra. Senator, thanks very much for your company. Hi, Peter. Before we get to some of the issues of the day, and I particularly want to talk to you, given your historical commentary about uh, the Palestinian cause, obviously about the events, the tragic events in Gaza. But before doing that, did you have a chance to, to listen in there on what Senator Cory Bernardi had, today, had to say uh, about his now rather infamous, uh, not to mention offensive, remarks about bestiality? He didn't sound like he was especially contrite, other than for the political damage uh, that, uh, that he may have done to his own side of politics. No, not at all. It was actually interesting at the time. He never actually explained why he made those comments or apologised. And after what he's just uh, spoken to you about, nothing's changed. It was all about just managing it for his good friend Tony Abbott. So it was quite unsavoury, the whole incident, and continues to be so. Mm. On matters today, domestically, before we go overseas, uh, again, I was talking to Senator Bernardi briefly about this, the, the revelations about what the Labor Party is looking to try to do uh, in relation to adjustments, lowering the bar, as the Oz put it on its front page, of discrimination laws. Uh, one that really struck out as being interesting to me was this idea that they're looking to change uh, the rules and make it a, a prohibitive one, that you are not allowed to discriminate against someone in a workplace scenario in terms of hiring them based on their previous uh, industrial action. In other words, uh, an employer is not allowed to in any way discriminate against a potential employee uh, that may have been involved in strike action or, uh, or, or some type of civil disobedience in an industrial relations sense. Is that really fair? Because at the end of the day, the employer has to guard what they think is the most productive capacity of their business, don't they? Oh, look, I think it's very fair and it's urgently needed. There's many incident, incidents where people have been discriminated against because they stood up for their rights. And that's one aspect of the legislation that the Greens certainly welcome. My colleague, Green Senator Penny Wright, who is our spokesperson on Attorney General Matters, is looking after this. She's identified a number of areas where the legislation can be improved, but it's certainly a good move by Labor to harmonise four pieces of legislation. We always need to lift the bar, it's not lowering the bar, we need to lift the bar in terms of helping to remove discrimination from our society and that's what this is all about. But on that industrial relations question, it's pretty understandable, isn't it, that the cynical amongst us will look at that and just see that as a Labor government uh, looking to make it uh, harder for business or employers uh, to avoid uh, militant figures potentially from within employee ranks uh, ending up within their ranks. I mean, at the end of the day, surely the business uh, should have a right uh, to determine the composition of its workforce. And if that means uh, not allowing people in uh, that have been involved in sometimes quite militant strike action, uh, that's understandable that a, a business trying to make a profit would try to exclude them, surely. Oh, Peter, I think you're quite out of touch in how you're representing the workplaces. This idea that there's people out there who just want to go on strike because that's what they do. Like by far the majority of actions at workplaces to improve conditions and wages are very well considered. Let's remember, when workers take that action, they're the ones who lose out in the first place in terms of loss of pay, etc. And they shouldn't be discriminated against because the action that they're taking is actually, um, they're taking up issues that will assist all the workers in that workplace. And to my mind, they're, they're to be congratulated, not to be discriminated against. Uh, employers should be fair when they're employing people and shouldn't be penalising them because somebody had the courage to stand up for better wages and conditions. And what about the reversed burden of proof, which essentially puts the burden of proof on the person being sued to justify their particular actions? I mean, that's uh, almost akin, in a sense, isn't it, in terms of discrimination rules, it's almost akin to a person having to prove their innocence rather than it being uh, the accuser being required to prove the guilt of the other party. Yes, I was interested in how this issue was debated today and picked up and it's worth remembering there will be plenty of time to discuss all aspects of these proposed changes. But there does seem to be considerable exaggeration that from my reading of it, it's not this total uh, reversal of the onus of proof. There's a requirement that those who may have been discriminating against somebody also have to put in some evidence. Well, that's fair enough. Uh, you know, this is 
these are complex issues. Quite often we need to reduce the discrimination. And I was disappointed that it's been misrepresented as this total reversal of onus of proof. And I understand that's not the case. So the Greens will tinker around the edges and, and I don't say that pejoratively, you'll, you'll, you'll have areas that you'll think are important to make some adjustments on, but at the end of the day the thrust uh, of the legislation, the draft legislation or the draft information that we're seeing reported in the media, the Greens are likely to support through the Senate? Oh, look, it's a good move, but it needs to be improved on. I was pleased, actually, it was in June this year that the Senate supported my motion calling for uh, the issue of domestic violence to be recognised as a form of discrimination and for domestic, where there was discrimination on the grounds of domestic violence in the workplace, that that uh, should be um, an offence, recognised as an offence. So there's a whole lot of advice already coming to the government and I think that we can come out of this with improved anti-discrimination laws which will make our society a fairer and more just place. So it's a good move. Are you a little bit cynical at all about the timing of this? I mean we've had the Prime Minister, we were talking about this with Troy Bramston, uh, we've had her misogyny speech, uh, we've had the reality of, of the polling telling us that Tony Abbott uh, does have an issue uh, with women or at least women certainly have an issue with him according to the polls and now we've got to talk about legislation, draft legislation coming in which includes a lot of changes to discrimination rules in relation to gender. Uh, are you cynical that this is all part of a political manoeuvring rather than just straight out legislative thinking? Look, I don't know how Labor determines its tactics when it comes forward with legislation. From the Greens' perspective, this should have could have actually happened much sooner. But at least they're out of the blocks now. The discussion can start and we need to ensure that that legislation is up um, and in before the next election. All right, before we run out of time, um, events over in Gaza with Israel, uh, the, the, the bombings and the counter uh, retaliation, I suppose, that, that has gone on. Uh, you have long been uh, a passionate advocate uh, of the Palestinian cause. Uh, do you ascribe blame to one side more than the other in relation to the events that are going on between Israel uh, and Hamas in Gaza? The violence on both sides need to end immediately. I condemn the attacks uh, from both Hamas and from Israel. We need to look at the context here because Israel is the fifth largest military power in the world. Its army is very well resourced and very well trained. Uh, whereas the um, Palestinians, you could barely call that an army. It's ver various groups of militia. And then we also need to look at the situation that since 1948, you know, the Palestinians, so many Palestinians lost their home and their land. Uh, much of Palestine has been illeg illegally occupied uh, on a military basis by Israel. And some of the reports, there's been many reports about the situation and the report after the last um, attack on Gaza by the Israelis, one of the comments that really struck me was about how we have another young generation growing up with such bitter feelings. And the killings right now must stop. Israel is a very powerful country. It has nuclear weapons. The imbalance here is considerable. The violence must end immediately. The blockade must be dismantled. The wall must be dismantled. Uh, and we need to find justice for the Palestinians if we're going to obtain peace in that region. Does Gaza need to, to have true nation state independence in your view and, and for it to, and I assume your answer to that is yes, if, if that is the case, what uh, are reasonable demands by Israel before they in a sense grant that and, and therefore give Gaza a greater status in the United Nations? At the end of November, I understand the vote will be occurring again in the United Nations uh, around on the Palestinian issue and the Greens will be moving a motion in the Senate calling on Australia this time to support that motion. Now Australia is a member of the Security Council, we really should be much more independent and not just vote as a bloc with Israel and the United States. With regard to Gaza, it's actually a very tiny piece of land. Uh, less than mm. 400 square kilometres, 1.5 million people. So there's a lot to work out here, but right now it needs to be the end of the blockade, the end of the attacks, again from both sides. Eight refugee camps are, are in um, Gaza and they're being bombed as we speak. Like the inequality, the, how disproportionate this is, needs to be recognised if we're going to solve this issue.
What about the fact that Hamas deliberately uh, seems to locate some of its, its military sites near civilian sites, uh, presumably to try to give them a level of protection? Now, yes, if Israel strikes, there might be more civilian casualties because of that. But, uh, you know, do you blame Hamas for that, for, for that tactical decision? Or do you take the view that Israel, uh, because of that risk, therefore shouldn't bomb? In the way you phrased your question, Peter, you've just assumed that's the case. But I haven't seen any proof that that's the case. Remember that uh, Gaza is recognised as possibly the most congested uh, place on the world, 1.5 million people in this very small area. Uh, so yes, the Hamas must end their bombings in terms of using civilians as shields. Uh, we hear that as propaganda from the Israelis night after night. Now we're getting it on Twitter. It doesn't mean that it's true. What we do know is that the violence has to end, the bombings need to end, and the blockade needs to stop. All right, Senator Leary Ann, and sadly we are out of time. I appreciate you coming on the program and joining us on Showdown. Thanks very much. Thank you, Peter. Good night.